from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And in today, K-State's Mike Stom reflecting on the 2017 canola harvest in Kansas and the varieties and hybrids that excelled in K-State's field trials this year. Mike will talk about what was learned from this crop that will be of benefit as another canola planting season rolls around soon. Also, K-State's Terry Griffin reports on the topics that generated the most discussion at a major precision agriculture technology conference that he attended last week in Scotland. He'll also talk about his current research into the economics of using precision-guided cultivation as an alternative to herbicide use against resistant weed populations. And later on, with Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoeven, right here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Well, we have the data fully in the books now on the canola production season just passed here in Kansas. Of course, Kansas State University collects that information. And we do take this time to go back over this past production year for canola comment on the planting season ahead. Likewise, canola breeder from K-State's Department of Agronomy, Mike Stom, is with us once more. So, Mike... Looking back over the years that you've been in this position at K-State, where would you place this canola crop 2017 in as far as its productivity? I think, Eric, we could look at this year as being average to above average for producer yields. I know there were some guys that were extremely pleased with what they harvested uh, back in June and some guys that were a little bit disappointed because yields were down a little bit from the previous year. But I think overall... Uh, It was a good year for producers. It was certainly another good year for the breeding program and our research trials across the state provided us some really good and useful information. Well, plug in some numbers for K-State's field trials. General range of yields, what were you looking at there? Well, in the research trials, the average yield was around 40 to 45 bushel to the acre. Now, if you look at uh, specific locations like the the Hutchison Research uh, Station where we have a trial annually, uh, we had exceptional yields there this year. Uh, Central Kansas, you know, 50 to 55 bushel to the acre uh, wasn't uncommon. Uh, and some of the kind of the more advanced trials that we have where we're uh, testing some of the newer technologies, particularly the, the hybrid varieties, we were even pushing 70 bushel or better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we look back at the year and, and kind of think about how the yield potential came about. And, and we did have a fairly mild winter compared to some of our colder colder winters. However, um, we did see last fall that we had very warm temperatures, and those warm temperatures uh, were good for establishment. We had some great stands uh, going into the fall months, but then we didn't have a, a period there to acclimate the crop to, to colder temperatures. We just stayed warm pretty much up until the middle of uh, November, even into late November. And we had a couple of time periods where we had temperatures, you know, below freezing, but nothing to really kind of set in the winter hardiness. Then about the 10th of December, we had a a major cold snap come through the state where we had uh, temperatures in the the teens. And then a few days later, we were even um, below zero in in many areas. And so... Perfect scenario for winter gilding. Yeah. When you have those really warm uh, fall temperatures and you get all that excessive growth and then you don't have the time to acclimate the crop to those bitterly cold temperatures... Uh, you can have some some serious issues with with winter survival, and and some producers saw that uh, they had a crop that was, you know, two to three feet tall in the fall, which is is just a crazy amount of growth. You know, you're using up a lot of your water, you're using up your nutrients, you're elevating the crown above the soil surface, which makes it more prone to winter kill. You know, those 
things all work against you uh, when the fall is excessively warm like that, and then you have a major uh, cold snap. And, in fact, you lost a couple of trials, northern Kansas and southern Kansas, for that very reason. Yeah, we did. We had a couple of locations that that saw that excessive fall growth and then, you know, temperatures to minus 13. That can be tough on, on winter canola. What we did see, though, were where the producers were delayed in their planting. Maybe they had, you know, we had some pretty heavy rains uh, there at the end of September that delayed guys uh, from planting into October. The guys that planted later, their fields tended to have better winter survival than the ones that were planted early. So planting date had a major impact on whether or not a producer was successful with canola or not this past year. We tend to plan a little bit later uh, with the variety trials. Not always. It kind of just depends on what conditions we have. But I kind of like to push my planting dates a little bit later just for that fact that we might get an early October freeze and I might be able to pick up some differences in varieties. We haven't seen that for a number of years now. Uh, We've really trended toward these warmer falls. So I'm not going to tell guys to go out and just, you know, wait the last week of September and, and plant. We got to spread out the workload with planting winter canola. And so, you know, that optimum window, I would say, for Kansas is really in that September 10th to September 25th. I would say, you know, if you can plant different dates across that time period if possible. But it, it just seems like lately the trend has been to those warmer falls. And so planting a little bit later may may not hurt. And in fact, I looked at the, the three-month outlook for temperatures mm-hmm. Uh, on the Climate Prediction Center, and they're predicting uh, much above temperatures for the next three months. So we'll see if that plays out. Yeah, word to the wise, then. Yeah. <laughs> Could that, in fact, <laughs> come to pass? Of course, you do collect the yield information on uh, quite a list of varieties and hybrids now, and you had some standouts. You might just share some thoughts on those. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, some of the varieties that we've had come out of our, our breeding program here recently. And if you look at the, the Hutchison data, which was provided in a recent e-update, if you look at the two-year averages uh, for the, the varieties in those trials, in the OP variety trial, the open pollinated varieties, four of the top five averages are varieties that are out of our breeding program. One was an experimental, but uh, there are others that are, are now commercial varieties, and, and one in particular Torrington, which we released last year in 2016, will be available for the first time this year through uh, Oldie Seed Farms. Uh, Another one at Hutchison that stood out over the last two years was the DKW4525, which is a Roundup Ready cert variety that we've licensed to Monsanto and marketed through to Calb. So to me, that's really exciting to see. Over two years, we've had some pretty good success with the cultivars that have come out of our, our breeding program. And, and then, you know, that's what we, we like to see for sure. Uh, on the, the hybrid side of things, this year in particular, uh, some of the new experimental uh, semi-dwarfs that we've been evaluating, I guess they're not necessarily new. We've evaluated them now for three to four years, but still a technology that's new that could potentially be a benefit, I think, to growers in central Kansas someday. And we saw a couple of the semi-dwarfs from Monsanto really stick out this year, and we're towards the top of the trial. However, if you look at the the two-year averages, uh, two of the ones that producers may be uh, more familiar with uh, were the Mercedes and Eddie Max uh, CL, which Eddie Max is a clear field variety. Those are available through Rubisco, and uh, they had very good yields around the 60 bushel to the acre. So it's good to see that you know, the material that we're evaluating is, is performing that well. And, and some of the stuff, you know, isn't, isn't developed specifically for the Southern Great Plains, but it's being brought over from overseas, but it has really good adaptability to our climatic conditions. And so farmers have some options um, when they're thinking about planting canola this fall. And beyond yield, Mike, what other traits should producers be concentrating on when they go about selecting a hybrid or a variety? I would say probably the number one trait that guys are interested in right now, other than yield, is winter survival. We've certainly had some challenging conditions over the past three growing seasons. Well, I take that back, actually four growing seasons. Last year, we didn't have any winter kill. But three out of the last four growing seasons, we've had some challenges with with winter survival. And so even some of the guys that have been at it for a lot of years uh, haven't experienced uh, some of the issues that they did. 
And it's a new crop. There's certainly a learning curve. And so, you know, genetics and the management of the crop certainly work hand in hand. And I believe that we have more than adequate levels of, of winter hardiness and commercial products now. But with some of the guys that, you know, may have the experience that have had some struggles, they may need to reevaluate some of their management that helps us to maintain winter survival. And that has to do with planting date, that for one thing. Plant, Yeah, we talked about the planting date. It has to do with seeding rate. It has to do with uh, fertility, uh, particularly uh, fertility up front at planting. Uh, with this big excessive growth that we've uh, been getting in the fall, you know, maybe cutting back nitrogen rates in the fall might might help with that. You know, 30 to 40 pounds versus 100 pounds up front definitely uh, would help. So there are things we can do with management to maintain the winter survivability of the crop. Definitely look for that variety that has proven winter hardiness for our climate over a number of years. You know, if you there's another variety out there that you have some interest in that maybe has been on the higher end of yield, but it maybe doesn't have that uh, winter hardiness that you're looking for, maybe plant a smaller acreage of that variety of interest just to see how it performs on your farm before you would go and pick the latest, greatest thing. Uh, especially if it's something you're not not familiar with. And K-State's field trial information is handy for producers now as far as that performance? We will be getting that information on the crop performance testing uh, website very shortly. We'll have a preliminary summary up there uh, that will have some winter survival ratings for this past year and uh, maybe from previous years if that information is available as well. So I would certainly encourage producers to get on that website uh, when the time comes when they're picking those varieties. Well, once more, another year of success in K-State's canola variety and hybrid performance trials. Be looking for that information to be posted quite soon at the agronomy.ksu.edu website. Well, planting season... (laughs) It's Miraculously, <laughs> we'll be here shortly, Mike. So we'll talk again ahead of that and to get into more on succeeding with canola establishment as the fall comes on. Thanks for coming over, as always. I appreciate it, Eric. Thank you. And that's Mike Stom. He's the canola breeder in K-State's Department of Agronomy. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you back. Our guest is just back from a trip overseas where he was an active participant in what's called the European Conference on Precision Agriculture. Once more, we visit with precision agricultural economist, K-State Research and Extension, Terry Griffin. And Terry, we wanted to have you come in to share a few reflections on this trip to Scotland for this meeting for a great deal of contemporary discussion on precision agriculture took place at this, right? And there was a lot of good discussion. A lot of people had nearly 500 registrants uh, at this conference. The opening sessions were uh, standing room only. We actually had uh, overflow rooms where they had video monitors of the opening speeches. Hmm. So, yeah, I had lots of really good discussion. This has been around for some 20 years, you say. It Mm. takes place every other year. But it's become a prominent exchange of information on precision ag? It's very prominent. So there's several of these conferences uh, globally. And, for instance, the International Conference on Precision Ag is held in the even number of years in North America. The next one will be in Montreal next year. It was in St. Louis last year. The European Conference comes in the odd number of years in between and it floats around Europe. Then last week it was in Scotland. And this was the 20th, 20th year, so this was the 10th 
uh, conference. So it's been around for a little while. And mostly comprised of researchers and other allied interests? We, we have a, a trade show for the industry folks. We have um, a lot of folks come in from uh, uh, the companies who uh, do network and interact. Uh, the presentations, we had 140 paper presentations from mostly researchers and academics, universities, and it was very well accepted. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about what you consider the prime takeaways from this conference, you and your colleagues from here at mm -hmm. K-State were recognized for one of those papers presented, Terry. So we want to give kudos on that. Oh, thanks, Eric. Yeah, it was, it was quite an honor and very unexpected. The way it worked, there was 500 abstracts were submitted, and the, the conference had a... Uh, a a cull or weeding out of those, and then they invited 240 papers, full-length papers. Out of those, only 140 were accepted for presentation. Our paper, who was co-authored by our Ignacio Simipetti, A.J. Sharda, Jason Bergtoad in my department, as well as Noah Miller, who's also in our department as a grad student, uh, we reported some of the KFMA data that we've talked about on your show before. Mm -hmm. Each session, the moderator selected the best paper for the session, and then they got together with the organizers of the conference and selected the best paper for the conference. Well, at the ending ceremony, they announced that our paper was selected as best paper, Very which good. was, I, I was pleased and a little shocked, actually. Yeah, well, well, congratulations. And the topic, once again, was something that we shared an interview on here not too long ago on bundling of technology within a farming operation. Right. How do farmers adopt technology? Is it piecewise or is it in bundles? And and what bundles lead to success, or at least, at least leads to continued use of the technology. Well, very good recognition. What do you consider the most interesting things that emerged from this conference and things that might have relevance here in Kansas in as far as adopting or utilizing precision agriculture technology? Well, one of the things that caught my attention, I think it's worth uh, mentioning drones and UAVs, uh, so the conference booklet had a UAV on the cover, like most technology conferences do right now. But all of the UAV topics were saved to the one session on the last day, which is kind of refreshing. They weren't just everywhere. Maybe two, three, four years ago, UAVs would have been everybody's hot topic. They were the buzz part expression. It, 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 yeah, it was, it was a buzz. And, you know, my, my question was, you know, has the bubble burst? Because it received a lot less attention from the tech community than I thought it would. In its place, uh, satellite imagery was very strong uh, as a topic from researchers in industry, and in particular Sentinel, which is a free European data that, uh, you know, it, it's what a lot of researchers here in the United States use because it's easily accessible, there's zero cost to acquire the imagery, so that was one of my takeaways was the less prevalence on UAVs compared to satellites. Mm -hmm. And uh, you think more application of satellite imagery is in the offing here because of what you saw? Well, you know, as a researcher, we're putting a lot of effort into how do we make in-season use of imagery. You know, the fact is imagery has been around for decades, and we're still not making use of it in production situations, but we're getting closer Progress has been made on how do we make use of these technologies in season, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be commonplace in 2017 mm -hmm. for all farms. It's for down the road some. Down the road a little bit. Yeah. What else caught your attention? I mean, you know, robotics, in particular for dairy production, is going to be a huge thing. And you know, farmers are in high-tech developed nations are adopting uh, robotics. I think that's going to be a, a big thing. And some of the ag attorneys I work with said, you know what, we need to start working on liability of robotics. We need to start working on insurance with robotics. And I think they're right because it's going to be something that's going to be here, in particular for livestock production. Anything specifically on crop input application, for instance, anything new, or has that hit its plateau, if you will? Well, variable rate is always a hot topic, and we know that we need to spend more time to understand the uh, yield response to applied inputs. In two weeks, um, the Nitrogen Use Efficiency Conference will be held at Louisiana State University, and several of us from K-State will be there, will um, be there present our research on that. So this was a beneficial and a fruitful gathering, it sounds, Terry, and, and yeah. finding out what is on the minds of your peers around the world mm -hmm. in as far as technologies for the future. 
Uh, it was a very, very good conference and something I, I look forward to. Hopefully in two years I'll be able to attend. It's going to be in France, on the south, uh, south of France. Very good. The Risk and Profit Conference mm-hmm. at K-State is coming up just a little less than a month from now here on the campus, and you will likely have a session at some point mm-hmm. within that program on precision agricultural economics, will you not? Uh, I will. So I'll give up an update on the KFMA uh, study on the adoption and profitability of precision ag. And I usually use risk and profit as when I uh, debut some of the newest research that has never been read or seen or heard from the public before. So, you know, if you're interested in, in being the first to know what we find, then risk and profit is the place to be. You are looking at automated guidance systems and relating that to something that has been all too prominent in crop production in recent years, the advent of herbicide-resistant weeds and dealing with those. What's the angle you're working here? So, you know, we've been using automated guidance for tillage practices for um, ever since they were commercialized, you know, what, 15, almost 20 years ago. And we started asking the question, you know, farmers who are not using conventional tillage, under what conditions would they consider using mechanical weed control, a road cultivator? And in particular, we framed this in terms of uh, herbicide-resistant weeds. And so the idea was uh, we would use GPS guidance for the row cultivator and increasing the speed as fast in, in increments of one mile an hour from five to nine miles an hour, which is kind of a standard speed to speed that's sort of considered almost too fast for row cultivation. But uh, with, with the right GPS signals, we can do a separate banded spray with the boom sprayer. Right? And we were looking at how much would herbicides have to cost for us to be willing to do this. And when we, we found out with when the speed of the road cultivator is sufficiently high, the, the cost of the herbicide doesn't have to be that high. It can be you know, in the relative range of corn herbicides we're using today. Hmm. You know, more expensive than glyphosate, but you know less expensive than some of the uh, more costly per acre products. And you know we started working on this quite a while ago uh, using whole farm models, and and it was kind of considered futuristic because people were saying, well, how do you you know control for boom height? Well, you know we were here earlier with Sharda. You know AJ Sharda has a fact sheet on automated boom height control mm-hmm. now. So right. you know the technologies have kind of caught up with this idea. And if, unless you've been living under a rock, you've mm-hmm. seen some of the herbicide issues um, the last several weeks, especially in the Mid-South. And, and I think this uh, paper, uh, which was recently uh, accepted for publication, kind of gives us some uh, insights into you know, how farmers will make some rational decisions to control weeds. But the general gist of this is that from the economic vantage point, there may well be justification for returning to cultivation with the technology at hand. Yeah, it may be worth uh, checking out the old fence rows. I mean, you have a cultivator, and and, uh, it's been said that there is no resistance to iron. Right. (laughs) That's a fact. And you'll likely be willing to talk this up with anybody who'd like to know more at Risk and Profit likewise? Uh, sure thing. I'll be at Risk and Profit both days, and uh, I look forward to all the uh, hallway conversations we may have. Good cause to be at Risk and Profit to take that and many of the other workshops in likewise coming up the 17th and 18th of August here on the K-State campus. Well, thanks for coming over for a brief few moments and uh, sharing a few reflections on your recent trip to Scotland and to this major conference on precision agricultural developments. We always appreciate your time, Terry. Thank you, Eric. He is a precision agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension, Terry Griffin. Once more, he, as well as K-State weed scientist Anita Dilley and others, attended the European Conference on Precision Agriculture this past week in Edinburgh, Scotland. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll step aside now and be back after a few moments with more here on this, the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you on this Wednesday. Now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, in past media interviews, President Trump's nominee for Agriculture Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, Sam Clovis, has questioned the constitutionality of crop insurance. Those statements may endanger his nomination, according to comments made by Senate Agriculture Committee Ranking Member Debbie Stabenow and the committee's chairman, Pat Roberts. At a hearing on commodity, crop insurance, and credit programs yesterday, Stabenow said that a nominee coming before the committee had questioned the constitutionality of crop insurance. She did not mention Clovis by name. It was clear, though, she was referring to him. In her words, it's important we all continue to work together to make sure we have the resources we need for crop insurance. Stabenow went on to say she's worried that opponents of crop insurance would use Clovis statements in their attempts to cut or eliminate the program. A panel of farm group representatives was testifying yesterday and saying that crop insurance must be continued. And Senator Roberts said, again quoting here, if there is some nominee who is coming before the committee who says crop insurance is unconstitutional, They might as well not show up. Roberts said after the hearing it's too early to say whether the Trump administration should withdraw Clovis' nomination, but that Clovis should have an opportunity to explain to him and to Stabenow why he said that. And Roberts also said that questions about whether Clovis' background is strong enough in science can be addressed when he comes to Capitol Hill. This exchange about Clovis occurred a day after 22 farm groups endorsed Clovis, even though he does not have the scientific background that the law says the undersecretary is supposed to have. Back in 2013, an interview with a conservative talk radio host in Iowa asked Clovis whether the U.S. Constitution explicitly authorizes federal crop insurance. And he said, quote, it does not. If you look at the enumerated powers, there's no nothing in Article 1, Section 8 that authorizes subsidies of any kind. Those were Clovis's words. Also, during the Senate Agriculture Committee hearing yesterday, Roberts urged Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to take up the farm bill this year. McConnell said he was looking forward to consideration of a new farm bill in 2018. Roberts said that 2017 would be better, adding that the committee marked up the 2014 farm bill in a morning and that it took only two days on the Senate floor. McConnell replied, the sooner the better. Here's more on that hearing with the Senate Agriculture Committee from the USDA's Rod Bain. Representatives of the ag sector testified before the Senate Agriculture Committee Tuesday on what they wish and expect as tools and trends related to risk management within a new farm bill. Producers of crops such as canola, cotton, corn, and sugar were among those providing their thoughts on topics such as farm safety net programs, crop insurance, and credit. USCA supports the continuation of both the PLC and the ARC County programs as well as the ARC individual coverage option. It is imperative that the next farm bill in include cotton in the Title I programs to access the same complement of risk management tools as other crops. As the farm economy deteriorates, access to credit remains a critical part of farm safety net. Crop insurance, too, is essential for risk management. It must be both affordable and effective for farmers and meet the requirements of our bankers. Testimony was also received from members from various ag organizations and the farm credit industry. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Major agribusinesses have gone from being among the highest returning investments for shareholders prior to 2012 to being amongst the lowest returners from 2012 to 2016 due to the downturn in the agricultural economy. This according to a new survey of 40 global agricultural companies released this week. This new report from the Boston Consulting Group on the state of agribusiness, however, shows times are good for processed protein companies, while the Those companies that find a way to navigate the near-term challenges in agriculture will come out on top. Seven of the top ten companies in terms of shareholder returns are in processed proteins, while the remaining three are a fertilizer producer, an agriculture equipment company, and a processed crop producer. Three of the top ten are U.S. companies, Tyson Foods, Dean Foods, and Ingredion. The average annual shareholder return between 12 and 16 for those businesses surveyed was about 7 percent. That's lower than all but two other industry groups surveyed. 
Now, this performance is a 180-degree turnaround compared with 07 through 2011, when the agribusiness industry's returns were higher than that of any other industry surveyed, according to this report. Although commodity prices show no signs of major rebound in the near term, the report said agribusinesses do have an opportunity for growth. It went on to say, quoting, notwithstanding the agribusiness industry's ongoing challenge, several long-run demand trends, including population growth, higher per capita calorie consumption, and the increasing use of crops in biofuel, will continue to support opportunities for value creation over the long term. Now, the survey did not include state-owned enterprises, private companies such as Cargill and Coke, or diversified companies such as DuPont, Dow Chemical, BASF, and Bayer. The survey also does not include cooperatives such as Land O'Lakes or companies such as Hormel. A northeast Kansas ranch recently was named a finalist for a National Environmental Award. Todd Domer takes a look here at the stewardship philosophy of this longtime ranching family. Chuck and Deanna Munson of Junction City are among six regional winners who will compete for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association Environmental Stewardship Award. The national winner will be announced during the Cattle Industry Convention January 31st through February 2nd in Phoenix. Munson Angus is located on the western edge of the Flint Hills. The multi-generational farm-to-plate business is designed to balance financial sustainability with responsible resource management. Five generations of Munsons who have worked on the farm embrace the stewardship ethic of leaving it better than you found it. The sixth generation to work on the ranch is being taught these values while awaiting their chance to carry on the Munson legacy. The family has implemented best management practices to improve the health of rangelands, crop acres, and water resources under their care. The Environmental Stewardship Award was established by NCBA in 1991 to recognize outstanding land stewards in the cattle industry. Other regional winners vying for the national award this year are Blue Lake Farm of Sharon, South Carolina, SFI Incorporated of Nemaha, Iowa, Sterling Cattle Company of Cohoma, Texas, Flying Diamond Ranch of Kit Carson, Colorado, and Jim Ohako Cattle Company of Winslow, Arizona. Including the Munsons, all six are family-run cattle businesses. I'm Todd Domer. Thanks, Todd. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. Yes, we have to eat, sleep, and work. But we also better know where we live and appreciate it. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. I had been looking for a small booklet among books on my bookshelves, but it was so thin that I kept overlooking it. I found it among a flat stack of books I had pulled earlier to browse and read. The title is A Practical Guide to Prairie Reconstruction by Carl Kurtz. Much has been written about prairie restoration or reconstruction, and lately I've started to pull the information I have together. I keep thinking about my border. Of course, the border is such a small issue that all one needs to do is buy prairie plants, space them, dig and plant. Prairie reconstruction is something else. And as we all know, 25 years on a project means little, as our real prairie took time. And I mean time to develop with its different soils, dry soils, wet soils, clay soils, upland, rocky soils. To appreciate the prairie, 
I am going to take you with me on a walk. By the way, the book that I was looking for has only 56 pages. It is thinner than a lead pencil. No wonder it was hiding. Now, come along. If you're sitting in an air-conditioned office right now or passing through Kansas at 70-plus miles per hour, you are missing something. Of course, the air-conditioned car or offices makes life rather comfortable when days are warm or even hot and muggy. But if I could take you and show you the prairie in bloom, I wonder how you would experience it. Can you take off your tie? Undo the top buttons of your shirt and let the breeze come through because the wind is blowing. We may look for shade at the edge of a large field and enjoy the cooling breeze under the bur oak before we venture out among the tall grasses. The grass is already tall enough to move with the wind. But between the deep green and somewhat blue-gray grasses are the flowers, the wildflowers which make the prairie bloom. If you step with me from out under the shade and walk onto the stand of native grasses, forbs, the broad-leafed flowers, you would see different colors, textures, and forms among the large diversity of native flowers blooming now. The colors range from white to pink, from pink to orange, from yellow to orange-red and even blue. Presently, my prairie meadow is painted yellow with brown-eyed students. But there are many other flowers, and you have to walk into the grass to see them all. Prairie or grassland parks often have a path mowed through the grass, connecting the different sites from lowland to upland. Such a path may prevent a chicken attack. But disregarding the path and the risk of a few chicken brides, Walk in the prairie will be richly rewarded. Among the whites there is the white bear tongue. It's one of the penstemons. The plains Indian chewed the root to ease toothaches. You will see the white wild indigo and the plains wild indigo. Its latter name is Baptitia bracteata. I will talk about that later. There is the white prairie clover, the yarrow, the plains bee balm. Prairie larkspur is one of my favorites. Fleabane grows all around. There is wild licorice, the roots of which were eaten raw or roasted by the Great Plains Indians. So much for the white flowers. I hope you're wearing sturdy shoes so we can continue our prairie walk. Isn't this much more fun than sitting behind your computer or hurrying along I-70? If you look around you, you see the yellows among the whites. There is the prairie ragwort. Soon there will be the rich yellow bloom of the showy partridge pea. The goat's beard blooms, resulting in the fluffy seed pods with seeds carried off by the wind when ripe. The prairie coneflower is blooming, as is the black-eyed Susan. The more delicate plains coreopsis is in bloom as well. And among the yellow and the white, there are the shades of pink, orange, and red. The butterfly milkweed was blooming, only a few left. Last evening, when I walked my prairie meadow, I again was amazed by its range and shade of color. There are the purple cone flowers, hoary for vein and blue for vein. The sensitive briar is blooming with its round pink flower dot. If you touch the leaves, they close and there is no computer involved. There is the common milkweed, the harebell and the lead plant, all growing and blooming. They're all together, each in its preferred niche of soil, exposure and moisture. It's a bouquet of wild flowers, native flowers at home on the prairie, turning our grasslands into something very unique. One of the first flowers I mentioned was the plains wild indigo, and the latter name is Baptitia bracteata. While the white wild indigo has medicinal value, the plains wild indigo, Baptitia bracteata, was used as a dye. When the sap is exposed to air, the sap turns a dark purple color. 
The American Indian used this dye to color cloth. And the way that was done, the cloth was dipped again and again in a bowl filled with the dye prepared from the plant. This dipping was observed by the botanist who documented the prairie flowers. They saw the repeated dunking of the woven cloth as a baptism, hence Baptitia Bracteata. Well, we'll slowly walk back to the shade of our single tree just to sit and gaze out over the colorful landscape, the grassland, the flint hills showing off the bloom. Maybe some cows may wander over to join us in the shade. I wonder if cows get chiggers. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Thanks for listening in on this Wednesday. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.